Hi, my name is Julie Huber, and I'm a scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And in part three of my talk, I want to bring together a lot of the information from the first two talks and combine it with a new method we developed in my lab to study subsea floor life at Axial Seamount. So I ended part two basically telling you that through our genomic tools, we determined that not all hydrothermal systems host the same populations, especially in the warm anoxic zone beneath the seafloor. And what I want to talk to you about now is how we've really been probing that subseafloor signal using something called RNA stable isotope probing. And the goal of this is really to focus in on the autotrophs uh, living beneath the seafloor without this swamping signature of deep seawater mixing through the crust. So RNA stable isotope probing is a relatively new method, but it basically brings together the power of stable isotopes with molecular biology. And the idea is you do an experiment where you put in a labeled substrate, whether carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or for some others, in our case, in a bottle, and you let an experiment run. And then at the end of the experiment, you gather and extract the RNA, you physically separate it, and you can look at which organisms have taken up that stable isotope. And this allows you to identify the active microbes during your experiment, you can look at carbon flow or interactions between different organisms, or in our case especially, really looking at what processes those organisms were carrying out when they took up that label. So at Axial, what we did is basically collect this vent fluid and then set up a series of bottle experiments. And in half of them, we put a control of bicarbonate, because remember, again, we're interested in who the active autotrophs are. And so we're looking at the organisms that have the ability to take up CO2. And we have both an experimental control with the light isotope and a 13C experiment with the heavy isotope. We then take those bottles, we add some hydrogen gas to recreate the reducing conditions beneath the seafloor. And then we incubate them at a variety of temperatures that we think exist beneath the seafloor based on our genomic data. We then let these experiments run for anywhere from about 9 to 36 hours. Um, and this actually took a number of years to work out the right time frame for carrying them out, because you want to catch the label when it's in the organisms that first took it up, not look at secondary consumers, unless that's your question, which in our case, it was not. So at the end of the experiment, we filter all of the vent fluid, we extract the total RNA, and we put it in a density gradient in an ultra centrifuge, and we spin it at very high speeds for a couple of days. And what that allows is for the RNA to distribute itself based on the density, and you can separate that light isotope from the heavy isotope. You then uh, precipitate RNA from each of those different uh, density fractions, and you can make a plot like what's shown here, with buoyant density uh, on the x-axis and RNA concentration on the y. We can take a zoom in on that uh, and talk a little bit more about what we're seeing here. So again, on the x, buoyant density, and on the y, RNA concentration. And what I'm showing here in orange is the heavy isotope, and in the green is the light isotope. And you can see that this heavy isotope is a higher density. And what that represents are the organisms that took up the 13C label in our experiment. And what I'm mostly going to be focusing on today is really the active autotrophs and what we're learning about them in this part of um, the plot. However, it's important to know that we, in fact, did a lot of different sequencing of this RNA to convince ourselves that the experiment worked. Um, and so we sequenced both the light fraction, uh, which was enriched, as well as its corresponding control. And we did that with both experiments. And that was to convince ourselves that what we're seeing in this heavy 13C peak are actually the organisms that took up the label in the experiment. So again, I'm only going to be showing this red fraction, which is those active autotrophs um, in the experiment. So here we have uh, an experiment that we carried out at marker 113. Um, at three different temperatures, up at 30 degrees, uh, 55, and also 80 degrees Celsius. Again, representing different habitats that we think exist beneath the seafloor. You can see that the 80 degree experiments aren't quite as lovely as the other two, and that has to do with these high temperature organisms having a higher GC content in their DNA, which often makes uh, these experiments a little bit, can be a little bit messy.
And so again, in all three of these experiments, though, we do have good separation between this lighter isotope and the heavy isotope. And what I'm going to be showing you in the next slide is just the sequences from this active autotroph peak in all cases. So in this plot, what I'm showing you is uh, data that I showed you in part two of the talk is that first plot over here, which is just the taxonomy of all the messenger RNA transcripts that we detected from that in situ filter fluid. And what I want to do is then compare that to the three experimental conditions just to say which organisms were active and taking up the label in our experiment. And so what I hope you can see is that when we compare what was happening at the point of sampling to our three bottles, they're quite different. All the colors are present in that metatranscriptome representing the diversity of organisms in this environment. And in our experimental conditions, we see less colors. And so basically fewer organisms took up the label um, under these different temperature regimes. So at both 30 and 55 degrees, we have a group of bacteria called the epsilon proteobacteria, bacteria, which took up the label. Um, in this case, these organisms tend to oxidize um, sulfur. And here we have organisms that both reduce sulfur and nitrate. We also see some methanogens popping up here at 55 degrees. At 80 degrees, we have a different group of methanogens within the archaea. Again, these are high temperature autotrophs. And interestingly, this purple bar here, these are actually a heterotrophic archaea. These experiments, um, we probably ran a little bit too long. And so we're starting to see those secondary consumers come up and eat the autotrophs. And of course, if that's something that you're interested in, sort of those trophic cascades, this is a great method to get at it. In this particular example, we weren't, but it's definitely set off some future experiments that we're going to be doing. So we can then dig in to those transcripts that we've created from these different experiments and say, well, how are they fixing carbon? How are they gaining energy? So in this example, I'm just showing different genes for five different known carbon fixation pathways, which are shown here in the different colors. And then similar to the first part of my talk, this is the metagenome representing all the potential. This is the metatranscriptome right here, representing all the genes that were turned on when we took our sample, and then our three experimental conditions in the bottles. And what you can see is all five of these carbon fixation pathways are present in the metagenome, meaning the potential for it exists in all of the, all of the um, uh, samples. However, when we look at the metatranscriptome, you can see that only four of the five were turned on at the time of sampling. And then in our experiments, there is even less diversity. So at 30 degrees, it was only the reductive TCA cycle versus down here at 80 degrees uh, where we have methanogenesis turned on. And so we can really hone in on which organisms which are using what pathways under these different thermal regimes. We can also look at how they're gaining energy. And again, this is similar to the diagrams I showed in part two, where we have the metagenome and the metatranscriptome, and then the three temperature conditions, and again, looking at oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, hydrogen, and methane. Again, what you can see is that first column, almost all the bubbles are present. In the second, less are present. You can really tell what's going on in situ. And then within our experiments, even fewer. And again, what this is showing is certain organisms use certain metabolisms under different environmental conditions. And we can take a look at what's actually happening in our bottle versus what happens in the, um, in the environment, because obviously we have major experimental artifacts here. Um, but by comparing it to the natural sample, we can see, for example, that a lot of organisms are using these genes related to oxygen. But in our bottles, we pretty much got rid of oxygen, and so organisms are switching to anaerobic metabolisms. We see a lot of organisms doing nitrate reduction at these lower temperatures. And as we move into some of the higher temperatures, we see a lot of methanogenesis going on. And this maps really well back to what we see in the environmental samples. So now we know who's taking up the label, we know how they're fixing that carbon, and we know the energy sources they're using to do it. So I've just showed you one example from one place on the seafloor and work that we still haven't published We've done these experiments at a variety of events across Axial and comparing them. And I just want to show you one example. This is the data I already showed you from marker 113, where you have these high temperature methanogens who took up the label. 
And if we compare that to the two other events that I introduced in part two, anemone and marker 33, you can see they look completely different. And so at this really high temperature range, as we had, as was suggested by our metagenomic data, there are different populations of high temperature organisms living beneath the seafloor carrying out autotrophy. So at the anemone site, it's this group of high temperature bacteria within the aquificales. And then at marker 33, a different group, with, which is in the same phylum. Um, and these organisms tend to use hydrogen, sulfur, and nitrate. And you can see that there are a few methanogens coming up at marker 33 in our experiments, but they really thrive at marker 113. And another cool thing that we've been able to do is kind of compare these experimental results with some of our genomic data from part two. And in this case, I'm comparing it to those metagenomic bins that I talked about, where you could really focus in on populations that were are active in situ or in the environment. And again, we saw just without doing any experiments, we saw that meth methanogen populations were very active at marker 113. And that's what's shown in our SIP experiments and our RNA SIP experiments. And again, two different populations of these aquificales were present. Um, in the other two events, and that is also reflected in both the SIP and the RNA uh, and the metagenomic and metatranscriptomic data. So by having both the omics data in and of itself, as well as the experimental system, we're really able to constrain who is doing what and under what conditions. What we're doing now is we're trying to take all this data together and put together kind of an ecosystem model for how autotrophy works in Axial. Uh, and there are a lot of other components to this model that I haven't brought into the discussion today. This is really just focused on those primary producers, but we've also been looking at their potential rates. We've been looking at the viruses that kill them. Uh, and we've been also trying to culture a lot of these microbes in the laboratory so that we have model systems to study and constrain a lot of these environmental parameters. And so what I'm just showing here are, is the plume above the volcano all the way over here, and then the three vents and kind of the dominant metabolisms and organisms carrying them out across this temper, temperature regime. So we're bringing together both the SIP and the omic data to make these types of models about how life works beneath the seafloor at Axial Seamount. So to wrap this up, both part two and part three, um, our omics data shows us that we have different taxonomic and functional profiles across these vents. They're quite stable from year to year, despite things like deep sea eruptions. And we're not sure what maintains that stability, but we think it is definitely linked to the geochemistry as well as the physical structure of each of those sites. Our genomic binning data shows that we have very vent-specific populations, especially deeper in the warmer parts of the subsea floor. And our RNA SIP data uh, also showed those same differences in those active high temperature groups, um, as well as different metabolisms at each temperature with an event. So even though all we're collecting is maybe a 25 degree fluid coming out of the seafloor, we see a huge range of metabolisms and temperatures that these organisms can exist at beneath the seafloor. So this combined approach is really helping us to define subseafloor primary production at axial seamount. So this RNA SIP work um, and genomic work, it's really kind of a deep dive into details. But since this is part three and the end of all parts, I just wanted to remind you of some of the big takeaways from this type of work. First is that the discovery of deep sea ecosystems, the hydrothermal vents in particular, it really changed the way we view life on our planet. And it's actually opened up even more possibilities about how we could think about life beyond Earth, potentially on ocean worlds such as Enceladus, which is Saturn's moon, or Europa, which is Jupiter's moon, both of which are known to have an ocean. Another big takeaway is that this very fundamental re reaction between seawater sea and rocks creates diverse energy sources that microbes can use not only to gain energy, but also to support these chemosynthetic ecosystems. And in thinking about all the possibilities, it, I'm quite certain we have not discovered all the possibilities for the type of energy sources that microbes can extract um, to uh, support ecosystems. The third point is that the subsea floor is really a global oceanic habitat. 
It's everywhere. There is a seafloor, which is the entire ocean. Um, and the dominant organisms in those environments are really these amazing microbes who put up with an awful lot um, to thrive um, in this environment. And finally, the deep sea is, you know, one of the most unexplored corners of our planet, as is most of the ocean. Um, and even though it's mostly out of sight, it should not be out of mind. So with that, for part three, I just wanted to thank the agencies that funded this RNA SIP work in particular, the Moore Foundation, NSF, and the Schmidt Ocean Institute, um, and thank all the great people who worked on this project to develop this technique um, in a pretty challenging place. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs>